Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow my Facebook page. Please also support my work on Patreon and Kickstarter. It will be greatly appreciated. All right, well, let's get into this. So here we are. Now, this is the we're just opening up the skull cap. So that's that's the that's the uh, uh, the skin, uh, then the cranium, and then as soon as you get through the cranium, you're going to start to see the cerebral hemispheres. And uh, in the cerebral hemispheres, well, one of the first things you see, you see the central line. That is the fox cerebri. That is the dura, which is also all around, going in centrally. Uh, and these are that's the superior sagittal sinus, so you can actually see it right here. So there, there you go. That that is the superior sagittal sinus. So that's superior sagittal sinus. If you go more inferiorly, then that just becomes the false uh, um, cerebri, the uh, the layer of dura that goes between the two cerebral hemispheres, and you still have the superior sagittal sinus that you can see the sinus anteriorly and posteriorly uh, that will continue inferiorly. So here, then, you'll see the cerebral hemispheres. And so you have to find the next thing you have to do, which is you have to be able to tell which lobes are which. So you have to find out which one's the frontal lobe and which one's the parietal. The occipital comes a bit later. But so frontal and parietal lobe, they use this thing called the inverse omega sign. And omega is, uh, you see that? That's the omega and that's the omega on that side, but it's the inverse omega sign. That means it's upside down omega. And if you see that, that is the central sulcus. That is one. Very posterior. Yes, it is actually quite posterior. Usually it, 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 sometimes it's a bit more anterior over there, but it's actually quite posterior, especially high up, right up at the brain. And, and as you go move inferiorly, it will sort of get more, go more and more medial but it is quite high up. And so the uh, 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 inverse omega sign, so that is just central sulcus on this side, and that's the central sulcus on that side. And, and so that's the frontal lobe, and this is the parietal lobe. And that's how you first start with this, and that's the frontal and parietal lobe. And um, of course, a little bit, I, I, I think I did mention this in the last lecture also, the gray matter is actually show, shows up gray also on an MRI, that's the gray matter. And then this is the white matter that shows up white, lighter on MRI, which is actually the way it is in the actual anatomical uh, 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 way. Uh, however, in a CT, it's the other way around. The gray matter actually shows up lighter than the white matter because the gray um, uh, matter is a, a bit more dense. So the gray matter is full of interneurons. That's where all your thinking happens. And the white matter are the myelinated neurons where they're pathways. So we'll do those some of those pathways also. Uh, but you should be able to see the gray matter and the white matter and the sulci and the gyri. And that's uh, in an MRI, they're far more uh, obvious. In a CT, they're not too obvious. Now, if you were doing neuroradiology or if you were doing neurosurgery, you would have to learn all of these. Uh, but that's not what we're doing. And to teach that, I have to learn all of those. So I don't know all of them myself. So the central sulcus is here. Uh, that's the reverse, uh, inverse omega sign that shows the central sulcus. And this is a knuckle. They also say this is where your, uh, uh, your hand movement is. So this it looks like a bit of a knuckle also, and this is where your hand area is. So if this is the central sulcus, then this is your motor side, and this is your sensory side. So this is your uh, primary sens uh, sensory area. That's the post-central gyrus, and that is your pre central gyrus and it's your primary motor area. So it's about, I'm sorry, say again. No, it's, it's, it's on, it's on both sides. Uh, so that's, that's your, that's your, uh, that's where, that's the right side. So that controls the left hand and, and that's the left side and that will control the right hand. Yes, and so it's on, uh, so it, it will be, uh, so that's your, pr yes, uh, I, I missed that, can you say that again? Yeah. Okay, all right, so, well, that's the basic thing, so now you can see, and then we keep going down, you can see the white 
matter getting thicker. Uh, and then as you move downwards, you will see the white matter join. Now where the white matter joins, this is your corpus callosum. This is the area where the two uh, hemispheres meet. Uh, so the two hemispheres are not meeting here, they're not meeting here, but this is where the two hemispheres are meeting. And at this point, keep in mind that your uh, uh, superior sagittal sinus is also continuing. So you see two dark things here also, and these are the lateral ventricles. So this is where the lateral ventricles start, start to show up. Uh, and that's your anterior horn. And then as you go a bit more posterior, you're gonna see the occipital horns show up also. So, so now as you go lower, what you see, you see more white matter, you see the ventricles, um, the, the lateral ventricles, and you see the corpus callosum. Now, as we go further inferiorly, Let's keep going further down. The ventricles get bigger. Now let's see, these are the ventricles again. So that's your anterior horn. The occipital horn is uh, coming in. Um, and then you start seeing the structure here. And that is the caudate nucleus. It is part of the basal ganglia. We'll, 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 we'll see it in the coronal section also. And this is a septum pellucidum, which is a septum that, is, that, that divides the two ventricles and is in, this, and is in the center line. All right, and then as we keep moving in fairly, you can see uh, this is now becoming the occipital. Now we keep going in fairly, this is now becoming the occipital part of the um, lateral ventricles. So this is still the lateral ventricles. The lateral ventricles go down quite a lot in fairly. So I'm going to bring them back up. So that's just, just wanted to show you the lateral ventricles there. Now, well, let's just do the ventricles for a second in this area. So let's keep going down again. So the lateral ventricles drain into the third ventricle. So there's a third ventricle, and this is uh, your interventricle uh, foramen of Monroe. And they drain into the third ventricle. And then the third ventricle continues downward. That is mainly, that, that's a big part of the lateral ventricle, but this is now becomes the main part of the third ventricle. And that's your third ventricle. And then the third ventricle, as I keep going downward this other way, that there's a little thing, that's the cerebral aqueduct, the aqueduct of Sylvius, and that will keep going down and find its way into the fourth ventricle, which is fairly low down near the cerebellum in the pots. And that's your fourth ventricle, and let's go back up the fourth ventricle, and that's the uh, aqueduct of Sylvius. And there is your third ventricle. And then if you keep moving upward, the third ventricle, which looks a bit smaller now, will join the interventricular foramen and they will, and that is part of the fourth ventricle. So the CSF is made in the fourth ventricle, um, sorry, not the, the lateral ventricle. So the CSF is made in the lateral, lateral ventricles and, uh, uh, and the CSF then travels from the lateral ventricles uh, to the third ventricle and then from the third ventricle down to the fourth ventricle. And this is important to know because if there's any blockage in the drainage of the CSF, um, it, it, it causes a hydrocephalus or, or, or an enlargement of the ventricles proximally. So the most commonly enlarged ventricles are going to be the lateral ventricles because if anything further down is blocked, the lateral ventricles start getting bigger. And the choroid plexus is in the lateral ventricles also. So, you know, you can see a bit of uh, tissue around there and that's the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is also in the lateral ventricles and so they're the ones producing the CSF. So I think that sort of covers the, 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 the ventricles. Uh, any questions feel free to feel free to come in. Now if you look next to it that is um, the caudate nucleus. I sometimes confuse myself with these because that's the caudate nucleus. Now let's keep going a bit lower down and then you will see Another structure developed here, that's the putamen. The putamen, and just anterior to it, it's not too well defined, is the globus pallidus. Now, and so let's, this is an important level. So you've got the, the caudate nucleus, the putamen, the globus pallidus, and the thalamus here. This is the thalamus. And you can see white matter converging this way and white matter converging this way. So this is the internal capsule. So it's the anterior horn of the internal capsule and the posterior horn of the internal capsule. So this is basically all the white matter, all the tracts 
the sensory and motor tracts going up and down from the cerebral hemispheres are going to go through these areas. Um, and so this is so that's basically the internal capsule, both sides. Again, that is um, the uh, caudate nucleus, uh, putamen, and globus pallidus is right next to that here, and the thalamus is here. So let's just keep moving in further and fairly. And as you can see further and fairly, those structures continue onwards. And now you are moving down. Now, a couple of other things. Now, let me move you back up here. Let's see something over here. Now, here's the occipital lobe. But as you go down, you're going to see something pop up here. And that'll be another funny structure. As you go, do you see that? Now, that is the cerebellum. So that is your tentorium cerebelli which is going to slowly move sideways as we keep moving downwards and the cerebellum is going to show up under the tentorium. So there's a tent that is on top of the cerebellum and that's called the tentorium cerebelli. I'll, I'll move it up again. And what is above that tent is actually called supratentorial. So the brain here and higher up is supratentorial. And that term is used common, so this is all supratentorial up till here. And if you go back down, and to when the cerebellum starts popping up to the point that it is completely visible, that is infratentorial. So these are just terms used uh, for, for, for spaces. So let's just go back. So that's your cerebellum, it pops up. Uh, now, let's just keep looking at the lobes. So that was still the frontal lobe. That's the occipital lobe. Now we're back at the level of the you know, putamen, globus pallidus, thalamus. There's another thing that I want to show you here that you'll see a long fissure here and also on the other side, but it'll show up a bit. Yeah, there you go. There you see it on the other side. And this is the sylvian fissure. So the sylvian fissure is what divides the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe. So as soon as you see the sylvian fissure, you're going to start seeing the temporal lobe on this side. So once you see the temporal lobes on both sides, let's just keep going down and you'll see the temporal lobes get bigger on both sides. You'll see them get bigger. This is all the temporal lobe now in the front. So you'll keep seeing the temporal lobe until they sort of vanish. So this is part of the temporal lobe. And now they have vanished. Now you are actually, uh, uh, now you only have the cerebellum, cerebellum and the brainstem. So that, so your temporal lobes have vanished there. And so that's where the temporal lobes live. Uh, so that's something that I also want to show you. The occipital lobes keep continuing downwards and until the tentorium cerebelli, and then the occipital lobes also vanish. And then you can see the cerebellum. That's the vermis of the cerebellum. And those are the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. And that's how the cerebellum sort of ends. Now let's go back up to the cerebellum. Now you know where the cerebellum is. But I also want to point something else out to you. Now look at all these white fibers that are coming from the cerebral cortices. If you let's keep going down, all these white fibers are gonna to come to these two places. These two places. Now that these are the cerebral peduncles, cerebral peduncles of the midbrain. So all your white ascending and descending fibers are here in the cerebral peduncles. And then, so this is the midbrain. And as we keep going down, that's still the midbrain. That's still the midbrain. And now you can see the fourth ventricle sort of becoming larger. And you can see there's like connections developing uh, with the cerebellum. Now at this level, you've gotten to the pons. This is the pons. And if we keep going down, this is still the pons. And now, as the pons get smaller, this becomes the medulla. And you can see the medulla keep going downwards, the cerebellum becoming smaller. You see the circular structure here? Well, this is actually not, the, not that one. This circular structure here, this is the foramen magnum. And from here, you act, this is now the spinal cord. So this is the foramen magnum, and we move superiorly from here. Let's do it the other way around. That's the spinal cord. Let's keep moving superiorly. Now here you're going to see the tonsils of the cerebellum show up. They sort of can protrude a little bit through the foramen magnum. That's the tonsils of the cerebellum that show up. Now that's still uh, the, the medulla and you've got the cerebellum 
uh, showing up. So now you can see the cerebellar hemispheres and the vermis of the cerebellum. And this is the medulla. Now this becomes becoming the pons as we keep going higher. That's the pons uh, along with the cerebellum. That's the nice big fourth ventricle as we keep moving upward. Now this has become the midbrain. Um, you can see the occipital lobes and the temporal lobes beginning, beginning to show. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the midbrain. And as we keep going up, the, these are the cerebral peduncles. Uh, that's the temporal lobe. Uh, that's the occipital lobe. And as we keep moving upward, the cerebellum slowly vanishes. And now it's the full uh, occipital lobe. Now you can see the occipital part of the lateral ventricles, that's the temporal lobe. Um, these are the sylvian fissures, so that's the temporal lobe. And then as we keep moving upwards, that's the temporal lobe. Now that temporal lobe is slowly going to start ending. And as the sylvian fissure, as we cross and you see this, this becomes the frontal lobe. And this is, uh, oh, and if you keep going up behind here is the parietal lobe and back here is the occipital lobe. And we've actually crossed even the uh, what you call the ventricles and we've come to the top. So there's a few ways of going around this. And so we've done that. Now, what else? Uh, a few things that you should be able to see in this. Now, the blood supply, etc. Um, let me take you to a few interesting parts. Now, one interesting level again is here. Now, where is that? Now, as you can see here, the things that we've already discussed, that is the brain, uh, sorry, that's the midbrain. Those are the cerebral peduncles. That's the cerebellum just showing up. That's the occipital lobe. Uh, this is the temporal lobe. Now, look at this structure here. This structure is very interesting. It's coming from here. And as I, as I move downward, it's going there and it's going into the eyes. So that that's the optic nerve on both sides watch these two structures come back together here that's the optic chiasm and watch these structures going back up there and those are the optic tracts so that's an important area to understand in the brain because what are the other structures around there you see that that is the pituitary stalk if i move superiorly i will come into the hypothalamus if i go in fearly, I will see the pituitary stalk then become the pituitary gland. And this, this area is the cella tersica. So this in, is where the pituitary gland is or the pituitary stalk is and where the optic chiasm is. When you come to this area, you need to understand that this is around the area where the circle of Willis is. So your arteries are around this area. Now, interestingly, the arteries are actually bright in this uh, MRI, and, uh, and so you can see them fairly well. Sometimes they're not that obvious, but here you can, you can see them. So, so you, can see, you can see this blood vessel moving there. You can see it on, you know, on the other side. You can see this one. So that's the middle cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral artery is a bit not is not too well visible here, but I will show it to you in another view and it will become far more visible here. But the anterior cerebral artery moves forward this way. And the posterior cerebral artery is a bit hard to see here also, but I'll show it to you in another view. But this is an important thing to see at this point that you know, you've, you've, you've seen the optic chiasm, the pituitary stalk. These are the mammillary bodies. I don't think you need to worry about that too much. And, but the pituitary gland is important. The cella tersica is important. These structures are very important. Now that we're talking about the arteries, if you know what, what arteries, so, you, so that's the internal carotid artery that we just discussed. That will become the middle cerebral artery. But from the posterior aspect, you have the basilar artery that comes up. And that's the basilar artery. And it's on, it lies on the anterior aspect of uh, the midbrain. And if you keep going further downwards, it'll stay there as the anterior aspect of the pons. And if you keep going, there's, there it is. Keep looking at that. If you keep going downward, it will be anteriorly in the medulla. And keep looking at that. Now it divides into two. So these are the vertebral arteries. And keep watching this as the foramen magnum shows up. These two are your vertebral arteries coming from two sides. And there you see coming in from the, uh, into the foramen magnum, coming in from the vertebral foramens, uh, sorry, the transverse foramens of your C1 vertebra. So these are your uh, vertebral arteries that are coming. Let's, uh, let's do those again.
and here they come into the foramen magnum, the two vertebral arteries. You see them moving upwards, the two vertebral arteries. They're going to join and become the basilar artery. The basilar artery and the vertebral artery is extremely important because it supplies the medulla, it supplies the uh, pons, it supplies the whole cerebellum, and it supplies the uh, midbrain. And then when it joins the circle of Willis, uh, it also, that's your posterior uh, cerebral artery going there. When it joins the circle of Willis, uh, it then supplies the posterior aspect, your occipital lobes, the posterior aspect of your, uh, I mean, all your occipital lobes and the inferior aspect of the temporal lobe. So that artery is actually quite important. So two arteries that really you need to be worried about, obviously in the brain, is the basilar artery, which is essentially your two vertebral arteries and obviously the internal carotid artery. And well, let's look at the internal carotid artery. Let's keep going down. That's the internal carotid artery on both sides. Let's go a bit down. It sort of vanishes. But here, they're going through the carotid canal. And if you keep going in fearly, you'll see them pop up on the sides here. These are your two internal carotid arteries. And then the neck. So they're, this is past the best. So this is the base of the skull. That's the foramen magnum. So they're in the neck there. And so if you follow the course again, They'll keep coming up, then when they turn into the carotid canal, which is here, then they move anteriorly, then they move superiorly again, and they show up here, and then here they become part of the circle of Willis. And then they give off their anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. Hmm, what else can I show you? Okay, yes, now, now that, that we're there, let me take you back to the top. And let me show you one more thing that I want to show you back to the top. And we talked about this. That's the superior sagittal sinus. So let's look at this part and let's go inferiorly. So that's still the superior sagittal sinus. That's still the superior sagittal sinus. Then it becomes a confluence. So when the, when the, when the cerebellum starts showing up, it will, be, it will start going into the confluence of sinuses. And then it doesn't show too well. The confluence of sinuses then has to move into two transverse sinuses. You should see one on each side. In, in this person, it's not too well seen on this side, but on this side, it's actually really nicely seen. And that is your transverse sinus. And in the transverse sinus, as you keep going on, that's continuing in the transverse sinus. This transverse sinus will become the sigmoid sinus. That is now the sigmoid sinus. And the sigmoid sinus will find its way into, into the jugular vein, through the jugular foramen. So that's your jugular bit going into the neck next to the internal carotid artery. So that's the internal jugular vein that will then communicate with the sigmoid sinus. And as we keep going up, the sigmoid sinus then becomes a trans transverse sinus and that joins to the confluence of sinuses. Yeah. So what do you think about that so far? Any, any questions? Let me see if I've sort of covered everything. So the ventricles, we've sort of done that, the cerebral arteries. And oh, the corona radiata, yes, I'll show you that. The gyri we've done, yep, yeah, and no, all that's kind of finished up. Okay, so mostly the, you will see axial views, but uh, uh, these views are also really good. Now, this is a coronal view. And so what can you see? Like, let me just get you into really... First thing, I mean, I find this really fascinating. Now, look, there's, there's a lot of gray matter. This is the white matter. Now I want you to keep an eye on the white matter and see how it all sorts of come, it will come together in one place. So there's, there's your white matter coming together in one place. And, and this, like if it's crossing over, that is your corpus callosum. These are your lateral ventricles. And keep looking at the white matter. And here, this is where, so I'm keep moving posteriorly. Here you can see the cerebellum. That's your, now we're towards the occipital areas. That's the cerebellum again. That's the superior sagittal sinus. 
and that's like that's the posterior aspect of your skull so let's move and go from the posterior all the way to the anterior and so you've got the superior sagittal sinus it'll be coming down so that's your superior sagittal sinus moving inferiorly that's the occipital lobe that's the cerebellum that's showing up on both sides the cerebellum is as you can see getting larger these are your this these two are the occipital uh, uh, extensions of your lateral ventricles they will slowly start getting bigger and moving medially this is your posterior aspect of your corpus callosum which connects the two sides that's your corpus callosum up there these again are your lateral ventricles here you're going to see the lateral ventricles um, uh, interventricle foramen draining into the third ventricle and I'll keep following the lateral ventricles all the way to the anterior and there the lateral ventricles vanish this is now your frontal lobe so let's do the ventricles first this way so that's your lateral ventricles again then the, uh, then the interventricular um, foramen that's the third ventricle now the third ventricle if you keep watching it it's now it's vanished but it forms the cerebral aqueduct let's follow the cerebral aqueduct down the cerebral aqueduct will open into the fourth ventricle and there's your fourth ventricle that's one so let's that's that's looking at the ventricles now at the white matter i want you to show you the internal capsule and basically the whole basal ganglia here so where did that go that's a bit more anterior and look at that now there now here you can see your lateral ventricles that's your white matter that is the internal capsule so that is basically all your white matter moving from your cerebral cortices down to the spinal cord and up that is uh um, the globus pallidus that is the putamen sorry sorry that's the caudate nucleus sorry that's the putamen the globus pallidus is around here and if you move a bit anteriorly and posteriorly you are going to see the thalamus the thalamus is right next to the lateral ventricles it doesn't show up too clearly here but i'll show you hold on one second let me show you thalamus here again so remember i said this is uh uh the caudate nucleus so i'm going to click on this and you can see where it is here and you can sort of see where it is here let me now this is the anterior aspect the anterior horn of the internal capsule and so if i put it there that's how you can see it there and in the coronal it's um in the cycle it's not too useful and this is the posterior horn of the internal capsule and if i put it there you can sort of see it there and the internal capsule as i mentioned is really important because if you see an infarct of the internal capsule your ascending and descending fibers are affected so the internal this area is particularly important uh, for uh, uh, strokes because the whole um, ascending and descending fibers are affected of that side and that, and that becomes quite catastrophic this is the thalamus so I'm going to circle around the thalamus and so you can sort of see it here so while I circle around the thalamus here have a look where that is over there and also have a look at where the thalamus is over there so the thalamus is in between uh, sorry not the thalamus is not in between but the but the third ventricle is in between the thalamus so that's your third ventricle there and the thalami are on the two sides and uh and so that's basically important thing to show you there and uh what else let's let just let's just keep going here a few more fun things uh here do you see this stuff these two things keep looking and as I move more and more anteriorly, oh no, I'm going posteriorly. Sorry, as I move more and more anteriorly, they will come together. Oh no, sorry, I was looking at the look at these two things. Sorry, what am I doing? These two things over there. Ah, I get lost. Move as as it moves anteriorly, that is your optic chiasm. And as I move anteriorly, now these are the optic nerves, and they will find a way into the orbit. And there they're in the orbit, and then you'll sort of see the eye show up here. Those are your 
superior inferior lateral recti muscles and that's and here is your orbit and so that's your optic nerve and if you keep following backwards you will get find your way into the optic chiasm as you find as you see that that's the optic chiasm so that would be the pituitary that's the pituitary stop that's the pituitary gland so that's the optic chiasm that's the pituitary stop and pituitary gland and another important thing now that you know what you are here so this is where your circle of willis is so if you look here this is where your middle cerebral arteries are so as i scroll up and down you're going to see your middle cerebral arteries uh, on both sides here and move up the sylvian fissure. So those are your middle branches of the middle cerebral arteries. And that's your middle cerebral artery. And here you will see the branches go in. So those are your anterior branches and that's your middle cerebral artery. And from anterior, then they move posteriorly over there. Same thing on the other side. That's your middle cerebral artery. And then those are your posterior and anterior branches moving that way. And what else can you see here? I'm really thinking that is the ocular. Actually, I don't know if I should go there. But one thing is interesting. You see, have you heard of a thing called, I'm sure you've heard of a thing called the cavernous sinus. This is where the cavernous sinus is. So it is right next. So what goes through the cavernous sinus? You've got the, um, uh, yeah, 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 the internal choroid artery goes through the cavernous sinus. Um, the oculomotor nerve goes through the cavernous sinus. Other cranial nerves also go through it. I'm not going to go through that right now, but the cav but cavernous sinus is an important space. And it's on both of these sides. And that's because the venous drain. Sometimes you can get a thrombosis in the cavernous sinus and, and the cavernous sinus connects the vein to the face into the, cav uh, into the cranial area. So that's an important area to see also, the cavernous sinus. And so let's look at these structures again. Uh, oh no, one more thing I want to show you. Sorry, I didn't, as I said, I'm doing it for the first time. What is the artery that, that, that lives here? And over here, two branches. And if you remember, that's the anterior cerebral artery. So if I go very anteriorly, not that much, a oh, bit less, bit less. There's a place where you will actually see the anterior. This is where you would see the anterior cerebral artery. And it moves up. And it curves, it curves around this area, and then this is where the anterior cerebral artery lives. So if you, whenever you see, this is also where the Fox cerebri is. So that's your superior side sign, that's the Fox cerebri, and your left and right um, uh, anterior cerebral arteries are right there. And they don't go all the way to the back, but they, but the, that's that's the area. So even if you don't see them, that's where they live. So that's where you should, where that's where you should be concerned to look for them. And uh, I can't think of too much else here. And if we do the sagittal, the sagittal is again pretty cool. So first, mid-sagittal, how do you know you're right in the middle? A couple of things you'll see right in the middle. Uh, first thing of all, if you look at this, that's the corpus callosum, so that you should be seeing in the middle. So your lateral ventricles are on both sides. of the. So there's, that's your lateral ventricle, that's one side lateral ventricle, and that's the other side of lateral ventricle. So the septum pellucidum is right in the middle. So if you can see the septum pellucidum, that's, so you are, that, uh, you know, depending on the, uh, everybody's not anatomically perfect, but that you can consider the midline. Now, if that's the midline, what else? You should be able to see the nice fourth ventricle in the midline. That's the middle, the fourth ventricle. The third ventricle is right here. And the lateral ventricles you can't see in the midline because they're on both sides. So that's your lateral I mean, into the screen, outside of the screen, that will be your lateral ventricle. Uh, that's your th third ventricle, and then this is your fourth ventricle. Uh, other cool stuff, uh, obviously, you see the corpus callosum. Other cool things here is that is your optic chiasm. So that's your optic tract, that's the optic nerve, it comes together, that's the optic chiasm. Uh, that's your pituitary stalk, and that's your pituitary gland. right in the midline and that is your uh, midbrain pons and medulla going down that's your foramen magnum and that's the spinal cord uh, other things that you will see if you move to one side you will see the singular gyrus or so the singular gyrus the singular gyrus is that is the gyrus just uh, above the corpus callosum it's interesting because 
one of the things about singlet gyrus is, 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 is the sulcus that extends to the end of the singlet gyrus, that the sulcus just anterior to it is the central sulcus. So, I'm sorry, so this would be the sulcus that actually goes through, so that would be the central sulcus. If you go the other way, that's your singular gyrus, that's the sulcus that goes all the way, and that should be the central sulcus. And the parietal occipital sulcus, which divides the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe, is also seen well in the uh, sagittal view. So that's the sulcus that actually completely divides the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe, and you can see it in the in the in the medial aspect of the brain, uh, not in the lateral aspect. And so that's your parietal occipital sulcus. Hmm. And that is your tentorium cerebelli, the tent on top of the cerebellum. And the straight sinus lives on it. So as you know, there's a superior sagittal sinus. So the superior sagittal sinus is up here, uh, right in the midline. So let me just see if I can get you right in the midline. Oopsie, you know, there's the midline. So that's where the superior sagittal, there, you can sort of see it there, superior sagittal sinus. The inferior sagittal sinus comes above the corpus callosum, and then the straight sinus goes on the tentorium um, cerebelli, and there's your confluence of sinuses. And other things, that's the, that's the thalamus, and the anterior cerebral artery you can see right here. You can see that? That's the anterior cerebral artery on top of the corpus callosum. There too. So, I think that sort of, from what I can remember, I think that sort of covers it. Any, any questions? Before we... So, I think uh, the quiz is... You know, we can move on to the quiz, and basically all of this we're, we're going to cover in the quiz. All right. So, these are all axial planes. I've done it from the from superior to inferior, so let's go from the top. And, and what I'll do is obviously, hey, I'll start with yeah, Would you like to answer these? <laughs> oh, is it in the check? I think it is. It's, it's, it. It's all right. Um, uh, uh, correct, correct. Yeah. Fox, correct. Yep. Well, they're so high up. Yep. Superior <laughs> sag sinus, correct. And D is the same thing. Yes, because it's just it just moves from the top and moves sideways. So D is the same thing. And A, I'll make it. It's just a dura. It's easier than you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dura, so that's that's the that's just the outer layer. All right, good job. We got that one done. Let's go down one level, and um, uh, it's a turn. A and C are very simple, or, or whatever you can think of. That's true. That's correct. No, that's you're right. White matter and gray matter. Now you are with B and D. No, I do not. Yeah, but where is the frontal? The frontal lobe. B is what will divide the frontal and parietal lobe. Yes, 
P is this thing here. A sulcus. So that would be the central sulcus. And D is that part that's just in front of the central sulcus. And that is the pre-central gyrus. And the one just behind it, that would be this one, is the post-central gyrus. And pre-central gyrus is in the frontal lobe and the post-central gyrus is in the occipital lobe. Oh, sorry, is in the parietal lobe. Good job. That's good. So, just back to you. Correct. Nope, it's not a sulcus. Lateral ventricle. And yes, you are right. That is it. It is the left lateral ventricle. Correct. All right. Fantastic. Let's keep going down. Your turn. A is not the corpus callosum, that is a corpus callosum, and that is the corpus callosum. A is something that's actually not on my list, but I did slightly mention it, and it's all right if you didn't remember, but that's the point of the quiz, is that it is the structure that separates right in the midline the two lateral ventricles. Pellucidum. I can't spell it either. Pellucidum, septum pellucidum. That Latin thing. Actually, I'm 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 a bit, I'm a bit confused myself. So let's confirm. So septum pellucidum. Thanks for Google's. Yeah, septum pellucidum is a thin membrane located in the midline between the two cerebral hemispheres or halves of the brain. It is connecting the. Yep, that is exactly it. It is connected to the corpus closer, but yeah, they're showing it right there. Septum pellucidum, and these are the two ventricles. So I think that's, uh, we are, I'm not wrong there, that, that's good. All right, so we've got that right, and uh, what is B then? Yeah, yeah, and this one is on the right side. Up to you. Want to do C or D first? Uh, it is still the superior sagittal sinus. And the thing, and, and the way it is, oh, let me, let me actually show it to you. Now the superior sagittal sinus is if you look at the if you look at the structure it actually any one of these is okay let's just ken hub it goes from the front all the way to the back so if you've got a cross section like this you're still seeing the superior sinus. yes you'll keep finding it so the superior sinus sinus until the confluence of sinuses and then they go become transfer sinuses so all cross section of the brain like here 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 you will see the superior sinus. sinus so oh no that's not it it is this one no that's not it either it is this one okay so yep so that is a spear saddle sinus and c it's a bit hard i it that is correct now that's the chordate nucleus as a chordate nucleus and uh, I, I didn't demonstrate it that way that as you as you start going down on the ventricle the chordate nucleus shows up but uh, you got it all right next one. Oh yes well as it well like uh, the thing two reasons why it's important the nucleus itself the bait have you heard of the term called the basal ganglia 
Now the basal ganglia, you will what you will see is usually what you will see. You can see it, that's where we are, but a good now th that's a coronal view of the basal ganglia. This one, and that's what we're talking about. That's the cardiac nucleus. That's the putamen. That's the globus pallidus. Let's open image in a new tab. And the reason it is important. That's your cardiac nucleus. So we're we're looking at a view that's like this from the top. So you see the ventricles, you see the cardiac nucleus, and then there's your uh, putamen and the globus pallidus. And this here is your uh, internal capsule. There are two reasons are important. Right next to the internal capsule, that's one reason it's important. The other reason, these, these three things collectively are the basal ganglia, and what happens in the basin, that substantia nigra is there also, um, and they come down, and what and this whole structure is uh, involved in Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. So, so that this 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 structure is important for Parkinson's degeneration in this structure, uh, depending on which sort of uh, um, uh, if it is uh, depending on which sort of uh, neuron it is, it can either give you Parkinson's disease or uh, it could give you Huntington's disease. And there you go. So that's what you picked up here. And, and now that we're talking about that, um, it, is, it is going to be his turn to actually tell us. Now we're one level lower. So we did this. Now we're one level lower. So, so from the image, let, let me just take you. So where we are now is here. We're at this level. Okay, so, yes. Correct, but it is the anterior horn of the internal capsule. Or anterior limb, not horn, sorry. Anterior limb of the internal capsule on the right. No, I, C is a cardiac nucleus, correct. Correct. He is not very well seen. It's like this area, that's it. No, it, I wish you could see it more clearly, but the internal, it is not, it is right next to the internal capsule, uh, but it just can't be seen properly. I'll, I'll answer it anyway. It's uh, the globus pallidus. I knew this will give us a bit of trouble because we can't see it very clearly. Where's the globus pallidus? That's the globus pallidus. So this is, yes. Yes, you should, you should know it's there. And in certain MRIs, it's very obvious. In this one, it isn't. So, absolutely. Yes, that's that's where it starts. So, glo globus pallidus. Let's just go through it a few times, and so you will know where it is. So here, that's an axial view. I think that's an axial view. And if I open that and make it large uh, in the new tab, and I'll make it large. That's pretty good. So uh, that's the cardiac nucleus. B is the putamen. C is the globus pallidus. And D is the thalamus. And that is one way to see it. Another way to see it uh, is in uh, the coronal view. And it funny, this place at this level, the coronal and axial view actually look similar. And that's why they can be confusing. Um, and, and this is how it looks in, in the coronal view. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me just say coronal. There you go, there's a coronal view. And 
It is, is it in here? Can I see it somewhere? There it is, okay. Open image new tab. So it's good to take time to do this. It might take your time, but then you won't forget it. So that's good. So here we've got it. So you got that right, which is a caudate nucleus. Then you got this right, which is the putamen. And then right next to that, that is a globus pallidus. So again, you can't really see it too clearly here. And that in the medial, that's the thalamus. And the thalamus is between the third ventricle, the two thalami. So that's the third ventricle. And that is, as well, now that we're here, foramen, for, foramen Monroe is the same as the interventricular foramen. And that is the third ventricle. Oh, sorry, lateral ventricle, what am I saying? There you go. So let's do this again. So that's the globus pallidus. F is the thalamus. Correct. That is sphere sagittal sinus. Correct. Yes. Posterior limb of the internal capsule. Correct. Well done. You know, this is an important. Are you comfortable with this? That is good because this is really important. And um, you got it. This is good. This level is important. All right, let's go to the next one. Oh, this is also the same level, but we're doing other things this time. And we are going to actually be doing the parts of the ventricle, ventricular system. A is the anterior horn of L lateral ventricle left on, on left side yes correct correct no it is not but you are on the right track uh, the, the cerebral aqueduct is lower down. It connects the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle. This connects the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle. It is the foramen of Monroe. Also called the interventricular foramen. Fake. No, no, that's not the, that is the, that's the posterior horn going into the, that would be. That is the third ventricle, yep. Yep, yep, no, I'll, I'll, I'll actually show you this again in another view. And D. Yeah, we just, yeah. Okay, now let's, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this actually. So let's go into the, oh no, where is it? Orthogonal, there you go. Okay, so let's cut this out. Let's go here. Okay, so the view is right at this level. You see, that's your lateral ventricles. That's your foramen. Now I'm going to click here. Now when I click here, have a look where that is there. And have a look where that is there. So that's where your third ventricle is. So that's your third ventricle there. That's your third ventricle. And you can actually even see these, the foramen of Monroe on both sides. And it's there too. Like if the foramen of Monroe is anterior. So if I'm clicking there, that's a bit more anterior but the foramen of Monroe continues on posteriorly also. 
and you can see it there also. And these are your occipital horns of your lateral ventricle. So this is still your lateral ventricle. So if you, if you look at it here, let's follow this and you can see it coming up and still that's still the lateral ventricle. And that keeps going back. So that is still your lateral ventricle. You see, they join there. So that's your occipital horn, the lateral ventricle, and that is your anterior horn. And I think that's it. Is that totally clear? Good stuff. This is good. Okay, so let's keep going. Your turn. Now we're a bit lower down. Okay, so just to make it easier, that is a fissure. And these two are still ventricles. Correct, that is a Sylvian Fisher. <laughs> uh, it is the only Fisher. That's true. It is it is sometimes called the lateral sulcus also, but it is actually not it is you're right it is not a sulcus, it actually is a fissure. Mm. And and it divides what does it divide from above and below? No, no, no. The frontal and the temporal. Yes. And what, what arteries, what artery goes through it? Correct. The middle cerebral artery travels, the middle cerebral artery travels in the Sylvian fissure. Correct. So that's good. All right, so we're done with that. B. Correct, that's the third ventricle. C is, uh, is the fourth ventricle. Uh, no, 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 it's not the fourth ventricle. Sorry, C is. It's not the fourth ventricle. Yeah, there are two ventricles. And which, which ventricles are the two ventricles? What are they called? The ventricles that are two on each side. And they're still the lateral. So they're the occipital horn of the lateral ventricles. Okay, now sh yes, let's let's look at it again. So if you look at it here, so let's go let's go superior. So we saw it here, right? So let's keep watching and let me click on that so you know where they are here and you can see where they are there, right? So let's go keep going in fairly. So now you can see they're sort of connecting. Let's keep going in fairly. So that is, that's the anterior horn and that's the occipital horn. So I'll click on the anterior horn again. You can see it there and there. And I'll click on the occipital horn and you can see it there and there. So you see, that's the lateral ventricle there. That's that's the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is here. That's the fourth ventricle. That's the third ventricle. That's the fourth. That's the third ventricle. So look at the fourth ventricle. That's what it will look like in an axial view. And that's what it will look like in a coronal view. And there's your third. Uh, 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 and then this is the third ventricle. That's what it will look like in an axial view. That's what it will look like in a coronal view. And that's the cycle view. And then your lateral ventricles. And that's, so as you go in fairly, they're, they're connected up there. So they're like that up there. But if you, if you go down at this level of the plane, like at this level, over on this side, you will see 
that in an axial view, you'll see one in the back and one in the front. So these are both front uh, uh, lateral ventricles. And that's the anterior horn, that's the posterior horn. And as you keep going inferiorly, the anterior horn uh, sort of finishes, because the anterior horn finishes. But the occipital part, which I'm sorry I call the posterior horn, continues quite far down. So that's all the occipital part. So lateral ventricles are quite big. Yes. And I think, let me show you one more time this one. This is what we did last time. There you go. It is actually, we've got the lateral ventricle image up on. So this is, this might be a better image. It doesn't show, it's just one side. So that's your anterior horn goes back and that's your occipital horn. And so it goes fairly, fairly back. So where'd it go again? So there you go. And there it goes all the way back. And it's got a part that goes into the temporal area also. So that's still your lateral ventricle there. So the lateral ventricle is large. All right. But that was good. Oops, well that's a good review. Okay, good job. Let's go one level lower now. And this is for lots of stuff here. But this is also an important level. This is the second most important level. Mm, no way is not the top of the spinal cord. Okay, before, now these are a lot of things and you're going to get conf Now let me just put that there. These are a lot of things you're going to get confused. I'm talking about that dot. Now let me get you back here. Uh, like, so I'll tell you what level this is. We are right at this level. So that is the, I'm going to answer one thing for you. And that is the optic chiasm. That's the optic. Now the rest, so this is the level that we're at. This is the level we're at. So the rest I am going to ask you to answer. A is that... A is that little dot there. I think I, I think because this is so complicated, I had a separate one here. A is that little dot there, right behind the optic chiasm. And I will show it to you here also. So A is that dot, I'll click on it. And so you can see the dot there and you can see the dot there. So what is that? No, 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 no. But it's the central aqueduct is here. This is the central aqueduct. Over here. Well, he'll, he'll figure it out. He'll figure it out. What's this thing? That is the pituitary stalk. Correct. Uh, why is there a little hole? Uh, let's go back to this one. So if that's the pituitary stalk, let's, let's go. So let's look at this image. So that's your optic chiasm. That's the pituitary stalk. If I keep going in fearly, you will, you will see it show up as a pituitary gland. And if I keep going superiorly, that's your pituitary stalk. It will become the hypothalamus. And this is why an enlarged pituitary, it's going to grow superiorly let's just so the pituitary you can't see it too well here because it's actually been blotted out i think intentionally there's a bone right here which is a cella tersica and so when the pituitary gland becomes a tumor it can only expand upward and what it compresses is the optic chiasm so that's your pituitary gland right there sitting on a cella tersica which you can't see here and i don't know why but it's going to expand up 
and it's going to get the optic pad. I'm sorry? Why does it have an annular ring structure? Where? So this picture that you saw from your previous diagram. In this one? The quiz. Yes. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it, it, it's uh, yeah. That's a good question. There is—is is it hollow or is it not hollow? Because the pituitary stalk connects the hypothalamus with the pituitary gland, and it's got arteries and veins in it. It is actually the other place in the body that has a portal system. That means you've got veins that end in veins. But why is it hollow? That is a that is a good question. Let me see how it. Pituitary stalk CT. Let's see what it looks like in a CT. And in a, well, it's still, that's how it looks like in a CT. There is something in there. Axial. I don't know why it's hollow. That's a good question. But I. I have no, I do not know. Let's see. Oops, I don't know how that happened. Sometimes I do something with my mouse. And no, I can't see any ac proper axial ones here. Where is it? Uh, it's not very clear there either. I actually do not know. I can't answer that question. And uh, we're going to have to let it go. <laughs> Maybe in your neuroradiology rotation, you can ask, why is the pituitary stroke got that little hole in it? But okay, so you got the... <laughs> so that's your pituitary stroke. All right, so what's next? Which one? C? Yes, B is the cerebellar peduncles. Yep. They are very important. Any injury here will cause contralateral hemiplegia because all ascending and descending fibers will be lost. Okay, so that is the cerebellar peduncle on the right. Yep. Which one are you looking at now? F? Yeah, I'm sorry it's right in the midline, but I'm just asking what this big structure is like. Say bellar peduncles are part of which structure? That is midbrain, correct. Yes. And if you're looking at G, G is talking about that little hole there. So what is that little hole there? This is truly a hole. You confused it with this one. Yes, the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. Yeah, it's called cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius or, or aqueduct of Sylvius because it comes from the cerebrum and into the cerebellum. So it is, so you see that's the fourth ventricle. Now I'm going to go up here 
like I'm scrolling up here, but while I'm scrolling up there, <laughs> I'm going to say it's all right. While I'm scrolling up there, I want you to look here. All right. So while I'm scrolling there, so that's the fourth ventricle. As I scroll up. Okay. So that's the cerebral aqueduct coming. Now I'm in the third ventricle from the third ventricle going into the fourth ventricle. Okay. And while I'm doing the same thing, have a look here also, because that's the fourth ventricle right now. And I'm going to move it up. And that's what it looks like when it goes from the third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. So that's the cerebral aqueduct. Where we go. That's the one. There you go. So that's cerebral aqueduct. You got it. What's C? Yes. I'm not sure. You, you may be right, but it is definitely the cerebellum showing up. Um, I'm not sure if the vermis is in the midline all the way to the top, but it's definitely the cerebellum. Could be the vermis, but you got it right. You, you, you. Yes, that's true. So, so the, the central part of the cerebellum is called the vermis. So uh, if that's the cerebellum, let, if you look in the middle, that's the vermis right there. So yeah, that's central part. Yeah, that would be the vermis. Yeah, you're not wrong there. So that's, that's, so that's what we got. So that would be the vermis and that would be the lobes beginning to start. And that's on the other side. That's great. Keep this place in mind. You see this opening? That's part of the tent. So that's the tentorium. You see that? That's the um, that's the tentor that's the tentorium. Uh, and there is a part of the tentorium as it gets up here, uh, which is what we were looking at right there. You see, it's just above. Now you can get brain herniations through here. And uh, this is one of the spaces placed for brain herniation because that's a that's a potential place. So the cerebellum can herniate up here, or the cerebrum can herniate down there. So that's that's a it's an interesting uh, point, for that matter. Yeah, yeah, it's a dura. It's the uh, the dura matter. Now that's the falk cerebri. It's a dura. So dura has two layers. One layer is always stuck to the cranium. And the other layer is, is, is the meningeal layer, which is stuck to the brain. Well, it's not stuck to the brain, but it's close to the brain. And that meningeal layer in, in between the cerebrum becomes a falx cerebri. And that same meningeal layer on the side becomes a tentorium cerebelli. And that's the one here. Yeah. So the dura has two layers. The, 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 uh, the osteal layer will always remain with the skull. But the meningeal layer, which is close to the brain, once it curves in, and it will curve in and be the fox cerebri, and the second time it curves in, becomes a tentorium cerebellar. All right. Well, that's done. Let's see what we've got. Yep, so we've got that correct. Well done. No, E. What's E? It's a blood vessel. Nope, not anterior, it goes laterally. Anterior would be going that way. That way and then up, so that way and then out of the screen. It's going this way. Yes, that is the middle, middle cerebral MCA. I can use abbreviations with you. So now that you were out there, let's have a look at it again. So where did it go? It was right, you see, there it is. That's your middle cerebral artery. And as I scroll through it here, have a look at it here. You will see it going through the Sylvian fissure. It's not too useful in the sagittal, but it's good to see it here because all these, these are all branches of the middle cerebral artery. And there it is in the Sylvian fissure there. And that is the Sylvian fissure. Important artery. And now that you're here, now that we're talking about it, did you see the middle cerebral is there? Uh, it gives off branches that supplies this area. And this, as you know, is the internal capsule. So if you had a middle cerebral artery infarct around this area, 
then it will blow the internal capsule and will cause hemiparesis on the opposite side. So well done with that one. Good job. This is good. All right, now we're one level lower. And now it is your turn. Yeah. So, t so t tell me what you're looking at. I'll tell you what I'm asking. So, you know, so sometimes it's a bit hard to. <laughs> Correct. C is the pituitary. Correct. I think you are correct. It is the pons at this level. If not, yeah, it's still the pons. Maybe it's the midbrain. I'll check. I'll check. I believe it is still. I I believe it's the pons. But uh, yep. But but you're in the right place. Yep, that's the cerebellum. That's what I'm expecting from that one. Yep. Correct, that is a cerebral aqueduct. A is a lobe. Yes, A is just a lobe. I'm asking just for a lobe. Yeah, that's a temporal lobe. Because now you're below the sylvian fissure and that lobe that goes forward like that is a temporal lobe. So if you look here, and if I look here, first I'm going to go up. So, well, actually, this is good. You see, that's the sylvian fissure there. So anything below that is a temporal lobe. And above that, depending if you're anterior or posterior, but above that is either the parietal lobe or the occipital lobe or the frontal lobe. So we are fairly anterior here because you can see it's that. So that is all the temporal lobe. So cool. Excellent. Okay, same level. These were a few interesting things I saw and I thought I'd ask you as turn. And which thing are you looking at first? And Okay, A. Eh? So it's a thing that's going into the eye. That's the optic nerve, correct. On the left. All right, so you got that correct, optic nerve. Uh, C is also a nerve. Now I didn't show it to you in the demonstration. I just saw it, it looks so nice here. So I thought I might as well ask. And it comes no, well, it's not the olfactory nerve, but it also goes towards the eye. The olfactory nerve, no, no, you're right. Olfactory nerve comes off. Let me see if we can see it. The olfactory nerve comes off the frontal lobe. So the olfactory nerve should be coming off somewhere up here. I, I'm not sure if we can see the olfactory nerve, but the olfactory nerve is slightly next to the midline at about this area. I'm actually not sure if that can be seen. But this is lower down. Now, where is this? So let's go down to that level that we saw this. So this is this one. So you see, this is down here. It's down there. Correct. That's the ocular motor nerve. And that's the ocular motor nerve. So just follow it. I just want to show it to you. So that's where it's coming out of the ponds. And that's the ocular motor nerve. And if you see it now here, it's in, near the cavernous sinus. So that's where the cavernous sinus is. And it will continue into the orbit. So now that I mentioned that this B, what I was asking was the cavernous sinus. Yeah, it's just, it's a, you know, it's just because that's, that's why I see, what are you looking at? So let me just explain to you, because it could be anything that I could be pointing to, but this is where the cavernous sinus lives next to the pituitary. Uh, and it's got the ocular motor nerve in it. Yes. 
No, I say yeah. That it's always it's it's hard to get into the mind of the, ex the questioner or the examiner. So it's good to ask. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, look now that we're and that's true. Well, now that we're talking about the cavernous sinus, you might as well see it. <laughs> What's going on with the kids there? Kids are great. <laughs> Minecraft. My son's really into Roblox. I need a good. Uh, which one should I write? I think that's a open image. Open image. Uh, you know, Google is the best for anatomy, really. Okay, so that's the pituitary stalk. Uh, and that's your, I forget whether that's, that's your cellar turcica. So that's your bone coming in there. And that's the cavernous sinus. It's got the internal carotid artery. That's the ocular motor nerve. I wish there was, let me find one that's better labeled. I don't know what happened. Sometimes my, yeah, let's just use that one. That's good, actually. Open image in a new tab. Oh, geez, it's too small. But you'll probably see it. No, it's too blurry. But it looks big here. Mm. But I think you can see it. That's the ocular motor nerve there. That's the trochlear nerve. That's the ophthalmic nerve. And that's the obducent nerves and that's the maxillary nerve and that's the internal carotid artery that goes through it and then comes back out and so that's the cavernous sinus that's the pituitary stalk that's the cellar tersica uh and the cavernous sinus covers it and there's your optic chiasm and an important important area because of cavernous sinus thrombosis etc So you get a lot of, and oh, this is also good. Might as well see this here. Oh, I wish it was a bit bigger uh, because that shows you where in the skull it is. Maybe that's a bit bigger. But, oh, it doesn't, but I guess you get it. It's right there in the skull. So that's the bone. So that's where the pituitary gland is. Just above that is where your optic chiasm is and the cavernous sinus is right there. Sorry, I just, I, oh, that's good. Thank you. Well, I, Got a bit muffled. All right, excellent. Okay, so one level lower now. Yes. No, no, it's not the medulla yet. No. It's the pons now. Now it's definitely the pons. That is the fourth ventricle, yep. Yeah. yeah, now now it's just part of the cerebellum. Which that is it left hemisphere, yes. Or is it lobe? I I forget what they call it. Left hemisphere or left lobe. I think lobe is also correct. Lobe cerebellum. Correct. That left lobe of the cerebellum. And A is the another a is the part of the cerebellum that Julian's already spoken about. So what is it? <laughs> Vermis. <laughs> that's true. So it's um. So let's look at this view again. So you see, that's 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 sort of the view that I got. So if you look at this, oh no, that's the view I got. So if you look at it at this point, let me click on it, and you can see it's clearly in the pons. And that is, you know, the uh, fourth ventricle. And then in front right there is the pons. Uh, and, and the previous view, I think, where the ocular motor nerve was, that was also, at, that's, at, that's actually at the higher pons. You're right, so that was still the pons, absolutely. Should have gotten a midbrain view. Oh, we did get the midbrain view with the cerebellar peduncles. Okay, so we've covered this well then. All right, I, my kids are screaming too. I hope you can't hear them too much. Okay, all right, all right, that's great. Uh, thanks to mums looking after them. I'm unfortunately is here 
here <laughs> doing it. It's like dad's doing the duty. All right, so. Oh, so the kids, so the kids on the iPad. The iPad is such a good babysitter that it is evil. They're on the computer. Oh yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, all right. Uh, no, these are not the tonsils. Yes, the tonsils are lower down. So this is this is a continuation of this structure, but a bit lower down. That is the metal, absolutely. And this is still the cerebellum, so we've got that. And now that's actually gone into the face and the mouth. So, so that's uh, too low. The brain isn't there. And uh, now, I'll, I'll just let you answer this too. So A is still the medulla. So let me just say A is still the medulla. But I'll, I'll ask you B. B is this structure that is one on each side, but two different structures. They are arteries. Nope, nope, nope. That's the internal carotid artery. These are the arteries that come through the foramen. The, these are the arteries that come through the vertebral foramen. They're the vertebral arteries, yes. And that is the left one. Correct. And C. This is what you were saying previously in this slide. No, not that one. In this slide. Yes, you thought that this was what this is. So these are the cerebellar tonsils. Yeah, this is the inferior aspect of I don't know, because they're two round little things. They're two round little things. Um, look. One thing, I, I, I'll i go into that one second again, but now that we're talking about the vertebral arteries, those are the vertebral arteries, I should have labeled them throughout. Can you see the basilar artery here? Now we're one level above. That's the basilar artery. It is off center, yes. This person's a bit off center. And that is also the basilar artery there. I should have labeled them. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't. I'm not sure if I can see it here or not, but it would be there. And no, but now it's a bit too high. Now the basilar artery will join the circle of Willis here. So the basilar artery is important to see in all your views. And I should have mentioned that. You cannot miss it. Okay, so those are say bell tonsils. Now we're down one more. Now, uh, this is for you. And tell me what you're looking for. Correct, that is what it is. Medulla or spinal cord. That's where it's... Yep. Are you looking at... If you're looking at C, it's this little structure here. Yep, C is still the vertebral arteries. And B is a bony structure. Yes, foramen magnum. Correct, that's the foramen magnum. And that's how foramen magnum should look. It should have space. And, uh, and I'll explain it to you because this is another place where uh, herniation can occur and your cerebellar tonsils, these things, can herniate through here and that causes the midbrain to get compressed and stop you from breathing. Okay, it will... It will that's the coning. That's the tonsillar herniation, and that is a uh, uh, medical emergency. And uh, so let's go here back to the cerebellar tonsils. Now where so that that's the cerebellar tonsil, and so that's what it looks like. That's the tonsil. They're already coning a bit through the foramen magnum, but that's all right. Um, when you look at the foramen magnum, you see it's nice and open. It's it's a lot of space there. But um, 
if, if, if you have too much intracranial pressure pushing from up, the, the cerebellar uh, tonsils can herniate through. And when they herniate through this area, oh, wait, 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 let me see. This is the best space. Oh, it doesn't show that well there. But yeah, they can herniate through this area. And if they herniate through, they, they're going to go down there and they're going to compress the brainstem right here at the uh, 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 foramen magnum. And that is another that is another site of herniation, which is potentially fatal. Cool. Okay, so we're done with that. Now, a few coronal views. I think there's just one. And, um, and that's for you. A is a superior sagittal sinus, correct? That's a good question. Now, this is one thing that I didn't mention and, oh, I didn't demonstrate it. Oops, I forgot. All right, now well, I might as well demonstrate now and you will get the answer. It is a lobe, it is white matter, but there's one thing more to it. And we've talked about the internal capsule. So there's the internal capsule. As a matter of fact, let me show you Corona radiata. Maybe in the brain. Okay, good. It shows it in the brain. So the corona radiata is... Okay, yeah, this shows it well. Oh, what a too small image. Can't you be a bigger image? Oh, no, this is also fine. So we all you, you understood the internal capsule that was here. Now all the fibers of the internal capsule then come and then they spread to the whole cerebrum. And that's the corona radiata. It's hard to show in this way. But this, this actually image shows it kind of nicely because it spreads all across, you know, anterior, posterior, laterally. And so it's one section comes, goes to the internal capsule, and then the corona radiata spreads it throughout the cerebrum. And, and so this image shows it well, actually, in another way. So it's coming up, internal capsule, and then this is the corona radiata. So it's all the white cells going to, to different sides. So this is... Yes. So what's happening is, absolutely, what's happening is, is that because you've got all this thinking happening up here and then all that information then has to go down into the body. So if it's, if it's from far to the frontal area or the occipital area, so all that information has to go down the spinal cord. So the corona radiata is essentially those myelinated fiber that collects all those fibers and co collectively become the anterior and posterior limb of the internal capsule. So that's that's what the corona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This should be extended all the way out to the gray matter. Uh, that's very true. Uh, and so that's the. It's all it's all it's all myelinated. So I guess this one <laughs> this one might be better. So all they all come together, and this is the internal capsule. That becomes the internal capsule. And there's a cerebral peduncle and then it goes down the pons. So all the ascending and descending fibers, and when they pass through the internal capsule, they become the corona radiata, the radiating crown. And, uh, and I wanted to demonstrate that because, uh, because all of this essentially is the corona radiata. So if you, if you look at this white matter, and I'm going to go from posterior to anterior, you're going to see it come together at the first the posterior limb. Wait a second. Here's going to be the posterior limb of the internal capsule is going to come together. That's the posterior limb. And then there's the anterior limb. That's the anterior limb. And so from those two limbs, all these fibers moving out, that's the corona radiata. And if you want to look at it from an axial view, um, essentially, well, that's too high up, but essentially coming from higher up from here, as you get higher up there, that's essentially all the corona radiata. And so that's what I was trying to ask here. I was trying to say that's the corona radiata. So that's the corona radiata. Yep. Internal capsule. No, that's true. No, D is not the fourth ventricle. 
That's actually that nerve I'm asking. That nerve. That little thing. We did do this just recently. That's also a nerve. And that's also a nerve. Yeah, that's the ocular motor nerve. Yep. Yes, E, e is, I'm asking you what arteries would be here. So what artery would live in this area? Correct, the anterior cerebral artery. Yeah, the ACA lives there. Okay, so that's done, that's good. F is this white matter that connects the two sides. Correct. G is the, the space that has the lateral ventricle. H is another one of those, but not the lateral ventricle. That has a third ventricle. I is a nerve. I believe it is. It's either the op it's either the optic nerve. I think it is the optic nerve, absolutely. That's the optic nerve. And the other the I actually think I'm getting this wrong. I think that is let me go back. Let me go back. I think I'm getting something wrong here. Because it's too high to be the optic nerve. And it is a bit too so we're what image is this? Wait, I get that image. What level was it? It was here. That's the level. So what is that? That is not the optic nerve. That is actually the optic radiation. So if you look at that, that is the optic chiasm. And if I move forward, that is the optic nerve. But that is a bit further back. So what I've clicked on what I've, is that one. And that is the optic radiations. So I got that wrong. That's one. So that is the optic radiations. And if that is because it's so far, they're more posterior. And so let me check if that is still the oculomotor nerve. So that would still be, yeah, that is still the oculomotor nerve. Yep. Yep, that's true. That is still the oculomotor nerve. And that's where it joins. So yep, that's the oculomotor nerve still. And, but that thing is the optic radiation. Okay, it's more posterior. All right, so let's go back to that. And J, what is J? It's a bit hard. It is an artery. It is an artery. It is the internal carotid artery. And let me show it to you again. It's, uh, how should we say, okay, let's look at it in this way. Uh, I'm sorry now, I hope it's not too big, it's too small for your screen. But let's look at this, let's look at this. And let me make it slightly larger and move it a bit higher up. So here you can see the arteries and look at this artery. It goes up and wait a second, is that the internal? That definitely is the internal carotid. Let's see what, there, so it's joining here. So that's the internal carotid artery. You can see it coming down in the neck and then that's the internal carotid going up. And as it goes in there, it goes into the carotid canal and in the carotid canal, it has sort of a S-like, course and and this is where the circle of willis is going to fall so let me show it to you in a schematic diagram also uh internal carotid artery in the carotid canal this is how it actually enters 
Yeah, then that's a good one. So here it comes. So it comes in, it goes in the carotid canal and becomes horizontal. And then it moves up and then curves around like this and forms a circle for this. So it's got, it's very tortuous. It, it's pretty straight until, but when it, to come into the brain, it's got this sort of tortuous root. Uh, and um, uh, a lot of these different diagrams actually show it well, actually. Look, this one shows it pretty well. So this is C1. If you were a radiology resident, you will have to answer the C1. Uh, C2 is the one that's in the carotid canal. C3 is when it moves superiorly up. Then C4 turns another sinusoidal way. C5 it curves again, and here it becomes the part of the circle of Willis. Uh, I don't know why they need that level of detail, but if you look at Radiopedia, they'll 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 ask you for that. They'll they'll it's one of those. Uh, actually, it's, it's yes. I mean, you know, you're, if you're a radiologist, you need to have those names. And I think it's also one of the pet questions they have in um, in the radiology exams. Uh, you know, describe the uh, carotid artery in the carotid canal. This you can't see very clearly. I think it's taking its time, but that's how. That's how it comes in, but I think I think you I think you get the point, and that's what it shows here. It shows that root. <laughs> yes, and and you can see it go around this way. You can see it come up, go into the carotid canal, be horizontal, then move superiorly, and then have this sinusoidal movement, and then at the level at this level. Uh, it, it becomes uh, a joint, it becomes a circle of Willis. And, uh, and you can sort of see that at all levels. So you see, this is where it's moving superiorly. So that's, you can sort of see that over here, how it has that curve up there. Um, and so that's, it's just a path of the internal carotid artery. Um, and I think uh, in the quiz, that's just one of the, that's a horizontal aspect where it is the internal carotid artery and the carotid canal. There you go. Epic. And now it's for one, one only sagittal, uh, sagittal one. Yeah, sure. P. P is the medulla. Yep. Correct. Correct. It is. No, that's this one. I'll move it out. That's the pituitary stalk. It is just in front of it. You know it. We've done it a few times. You just. <laughs> yeah, you can come. Do you want me to answer it? I'll just answer it. Optic chiasm. <laughs> well, that's, so that's the optic chiasm. All right. K is hard. K is hard. Yep. 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 Lateral ventricle. Yep. Yep. Sure. Yes, that's the central sulcus. Okay. This one? No. This 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 drains into here. That's the third ventricle.
That is a straight sinus. The straight sinus is in there. Uh, you wouldn't be wrong, but that is the tentorium cerebellar. D is a sinus. What? The straight sinus and the superior sinusal sinus drain into this. It's called the confluence of sinuses. I'm sorry? A confluence of sinuses. Uh, yeah, it is. E is cerebellum. F is fourth ventricle, correct. Look, K you can let go. Yeah, A, A you should A shouldn't be. It's right next to the third ventricle. The third ventricle is in the middle, and there's these two things on the side. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you you've got your answer. It is the thalamus. That's the thalamus. Yes. Oh, H. H is not the thalamus. Sorry, H. No, 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 no. No, no, no. H is not the thalamus. H, H is the gyrus that's above the corpus callosum. Singulate gyrus. And K is... K, oh, K is hot. K is absolutely hot. It's a blood vessel. It's an artery. Which artery would go, go this way? Yes, that's the ACA. Good job, people. And that is the end of the quiz. So I really think... You know, I mean, that's very well done. I think you guys really did do well. You really got through a lot of it. So what do you want? You want a five-minute break and then come to the pathology quiz? Sounds good. Because it's uh, late at night and we might as well get this done with. But good job. It's, it's going really well. I actually think this is this is a great session. It's one of the best I've ever done. So let's go. This will The pathology quiz will actually really get your you know consolidate your knowledge okay so terrible image but it does the job this is a stroke in this region if it's an acute sort of stroke and this is what a ct looks like so it's not an mri anymore uh and an acute stroke the blood is brighter than the tissues uh in, in, in a very acute stroke so but that's not the question. The question is, where is the stroke and what artery is it in? So this is for Correct, right anterior cerebral artery stroke. That is very true. Yes. Now up here, it would affect the left lower limb region, but up there, it's going to be more behavioral. Behavior. Behavior related. Be I, I can't say though. And, uh, uh, but good job. ACA and... The, I, I think this is lower down, where you can see the ventricles, that's higher up. So this is more superior. And so that area and this area, absolutely. So there you go, ACA stroke. Now, this one's for That's MCA territory, absolutely. And um, so MCA uh, uh, on the left side, uh, 
uh, and so it's going to cause right side. What what weakness is it going to cause, or what illness is it going to cause? Problem with speech, absolutely. Uh, it it may this may it may spare the lower limbs, so not hemiparesis. It will spare the lower limbs, but it will get the face because that's where the face is, and upper limb, and speech definitely because it's on the left side. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. And. There's potentially bleeding into the ventricles also. Because there's no, because there's brightness here. There's brightness. Yes, that little bit of brightness. But the asymmetry is very important. I didn't mention that. But yes, you must also check for the midline and if there's a midline shift. And there is a slight midline shift. Not too much, but in certain masses or bleeding, you will see a bigger one. But yes, you must look for a midline shift there, absolutely, uh, uh, if it becomes asymmetrical. Now, let's just, uh, while we're at it, let, let me, let's revise the homunculus one more time. So here, oh, this is a good image. There's a good image for the homunculus. So it's same for motor and sensory. So here you are. So this is this is the cerebral cortex. So your low limb, the pelvis is here actually. I don't know why they don't put the pelvis in every time. But your pelvis is in this area. And then it's your feet. And then as you go laterally, it becomes your hands, your face, your mouth, your teeth, and your tongue. So the most lateral aspects of your cerebral hemispheres are your mouth and face. Uh, and then it comes your hands, upper limb. And as it comes into the anterior cerebral artery territory, which is this, it is your torso, not your torso, but your hips, your, and your lower limbs. So middle cerebral artery is this area. So you're going to lose facial droop um, and uh, potentially upper limb. And this is anterior cerebral artery area. So great, let's keep doing this. Okay, so this was middle cerebral artery. Yep, MCA stroke. Next one. So the problem is here. This is a, this is this is actually an MRI. This one. And this I. Yep, it can be blood in the ventricles, absolutely. Uh, blood in the fourth ventricle, or it could be an, I, I'm not actually sure, it could be an old stroke in which um, the ischemic tissue is now infarcted and, and is scarred. But nonetheless, what artery? That, that is the posterior cerebral artery. And... Uh, No, no, not necessarily. Uh, occipital lobe, yes. That will be affecting. Yep. And so you will have a contralateral hemonymous hemianopia. Does that sort of make <laughs> too much? Huh? Uh, let's say every year with a, if, if you've got an injury on the right side, then your both eyes left field of view will be lost. So it's a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. All right. So which artery is it and what would you expect at this level? Yeah, you got the MCA again. And uh, again on the left side, and it's a bit more anterior, so it's a bit more frontal. It may have actually missed the motor and sensory areas, but it will definitely get the speech areas. So, yep. 
I, I can't actually say, but but uh, this is how you can kind of tell. Well, let's 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 look at it this way. Uh, cerebral hemispheres, not hemorrhage. Sorry, hemispheres. So if you look at an image here, so what you're looking here, so that's your central sulcus. That's your primary motor area. So that's your primary motor area. Oh no, where's the central? That's, that, so that's your central sulcus. It's calling it primary central. So if that's your central sulcus, that's your primary motor area. And if the infarct is here, that's still middle cerebral artery, you just might fit the motor area, but you're still gonna get the speech areas. So it's like this. Now, if this is a central sulcus, that's the central sulcus, then that is your primary motor area, just anterior to it. But it seems like this infarct is here, so it may have just missed that motor area. You never know, though. You will always have to compare with the clinical, clinical picture. The clinical picture is the most important thing. All right, but you're right. MCA stroke, MCA region. And I think you uh, got the same thing again. Posterior. It's the other side this time, yeah. And, uh, and but contralateral homonymous hemianopia, so visual loss on the um, uh, opposite side. So the visual loss will now be uh, on this side, which is the right side. All right. Yep. So that's a PCA stroke. Good. Okay. That is right ACA, correct. Right ACA stroke, I should have had the left side on it. Correct, so now you're understanding what's going on. Okay, now these are hemorrhages. You have to, these are very important. You have to know these. So that's a hemorrhage, but there are four types of hemorrhages. There is an extradural hemorrhage. There's a subdural hemorrhage. There's a subarachnoid hemorrhage and there is an intracerebral bleed. And I will show you the differences, but again, this is your turn. Have a guess. What sort of hemorrhage is it? This is not subdural. <laughs> subdural does look like a banana, actually, yes. This is the lemon. It's something dural. So what's the other? It's extra dural. Correct. So, so absolutely. You see some bleeding on the outside also. So if you have a trauma and if a meningeal artery ruptures, then the bleeding is outside the dura. And so it looks like a lemon or, or a football or like the you know, rugby ball. And that's an extra dural hemorrhage. And you will see a midline shift also. But yeah, absolutely. So history of trauma. Uh, and, and if it looks like this, extra drill hemorrhage. It has to be decompressed. So you can actually drill a hole in the skull and you can decompress this. But if it's a subarachnoid bleed or intracerebral, you can't because that bleed is inside the dura. For that, even if you drill a hole, you will have to make a hole into the dura. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But if it looks like that, extra dural, always. Okay, and feel free to Google them. You'll see a lot of them looking like that. We'll see a few more here also. Okay, so this is for you. So where's the bleeding? There's the bleeding. This is a subdural, absolutely. So because subdural is a venous bleed, it doesn't have as much of a mass effect. Extradural is an arterial bleed. Uh, so this is absolutely subdural. And you see, it doesn't have that much of a mass effect. And subdural can also be chronic. You know, like football players get it. Chronic head injuries, they get it. And common in elderly also. So uh, that's a subdural hemorrhage. Excellent. So that's, that's good. Yeah. No, no, that's an extra dual one. That's the extra dual one. Yeah, yeah. They hit the head. They're okay. About 20 minutes later, they collapse, extra dual. 
in subdural ones, they, they keep hitting their head and they can collapse in a subdural one also, but it has less of a mass effect. Now, this thing is obviously going to cause, it's also going to cause potentially herniations, etc. So this is going to have a big mass effect. Subdural, you can also collapse. Old, elderly people, if they even have a mild fall, you, can, you must suspect a subdural. But like if an elderly person, like I'm sitting on a chair, if I fell and I hit my head, you wouldn't expect at my age or younger people to have this. However, if I were playing football and somebody kicked my head or, had a, or if I was in a road traffic accident and hurt my head there, then you should expect one. But in a person six, 70 or above, fell off a chair, you, you can suspect this. Uh, but if I was a young boxer, like a 19 year old boxer, I, you could expect this, <laughs> but I will still be conscious. I'll... Absolutely. All soccer players, boxers, uh, rugby players. I'm sorry. <laughs> what is CTE? Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 chronic traumatic brain injury that, that they also, uh, yeah, uh, 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 they also get, uh, their IQ also goes down. Their cognition and IQ both go down slowly with this. So, uh, but that's the way it is. Rugby, rugby is a, it happens to a lot of rugby players. So, hmm, so that's what you got. So there you go, subdural hemorrhage. Good job. Okay, now this is looks normal but what you've got you've got all these okay no, good good okay you've got so you see you've got your white stuff white stuff extra white there some more extra white here some white there there's all the white extra white is blood so which time this is subarachnoid so subarachnoid is going to diffuse into the subarachnoid space so it's going to look like this diffuse bleeding now for this one you can't drill a hole you know there's nothing you can do about this. You just have to leave it. It settles itself or it'll get worse, but there's nothing you can do. So that's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Oh, absolutely. What, what, if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course this, you cannot do anything about the blood that has already bled, but if you have to find the bleeding artery, you have to find the bleeding artery and absolutely try to clot it and, there's several options for that. Uh, absolutely. Okay, whose turn is it? I forget. Is it J's turn or J's turn? Yeah, what is this? This is a bleed. It's not extra or subdural. It's an intracerebral bleed. Absolutely. So this is when a big artery ruptures and the bleeding actually goes into the brain tissue. Uh, and it's not diffused like subarachnoid bleed. So it's a, it, no a late uh, 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 no a late subarachnoid. Uh, initially, the bleed can be subarachnoid, but if it's a big enough bleed, it will become an intracerebral bleed. Uh, a subarachnoid bleed like this is a very small rupture in an artery or an aneurysm that ruptures. You can you get something like this. But if you had a proper like a rupture in an artery, then it would become an intracerebral bleed. Pretty serious. Okay, interesting. That's interesting. So that's good. Now we'll do. Let's do one more of these. So it's uh, turn. So which one does this look like? Well, it looks a bit subdural. It is subdural. Absolutely. With a midline shift. So this is a bit more aggressive of a subdural one. But yeah, it is a subdural with a midline shift. Correct. All right, so this is for you. Extra dural. You can probably even see the fracture here, and you can see the bleeding outside or the or the bruise outside also. Absolutely. So this is extra dural, and this is. It's also it's bleed it's bled into the ventricles. But this is also blood. It is not subdural. It is not subdural. 
It is interest rebuild, absolutely. It is interest rebuild. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, there's a midline shift, and so this bleeding is causing the brain to shift to the side also. All right, and this one. Subarachnoid, diffuse bleeding in different compartments of the brain. All right. Now what is this? Oh yeah, I got it. This is an infarct in this area. Now I remember what, in this area. Yes, now I, I got myself confused also. But it's actually, it's not occipital, it's lower down. So what would be in the posterior area if it's not occipital? The cerebellum. So my question really was from here that it is a cerebellar stroke, but what artery is responsible for a cerebellar stroke? Yes, the basilar or vertebral arteries, absolutely. So you should... Worry about the basilar artery also for a cerebral uh, cerebellar stroke. So here you are. You can see where the stroke is. Yep, it is slightly off. Yep, again, basilar artery, absolutely, because there's your pons and, and there's a the cerebellum and that's where the stroke is, correct? That would be a basilar artery stroke. Correct, correct, correct. And uh, functionally, if you just had a cerebellar stroke, what would you lose? You would lose your coordination. But if you had a stroke of the pons, what would you lose? Everything goes to there. So pretend even a small infarct in the pons can have a big effect because your ascending and descending fibers are there. So it depends what it goes through, but if it's big enough, which is quite big here, it could actually cause paraplegia on both sides. Fate worse than death. All right. What is that? It does work. Big ventricles, absolutely. Very big ventricles. Yes. So, that's just hydrocef. No, no, no. Hi, uh, hi, yeah, yeah, I. Uh, too much CSF. Sorry, hydrocephalus. So we're out of strokes. Yeah, I should have should have mentioned that. Yeah, uh, we're not talking about. No, no, no. Hydrocephalus, and so it's too much CSF. I'm not really sure what the cause of this was. I just googled hydrocephalus, and I'm like, yep, we'll talk about it. But uh, could be anything. Anything blocking uh, the uh, aqueducts, or anything blocking the flow of the of the uh, CSF. It could be actually, yes, yes. It could be a church. Ch ch I don't know. I can't remember. I do not remember. I do not remember. And uh, but a brain tumor can do it also. Like a tumor, a, a tumor growing and 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 blocking one of the ducts could cause hydrocephalus also. Uh, but yes, in children, um, uh, it it is it is. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, congenitally you can have hydrocephalus and the treatment for that is that they actually put a little stu uh, uh, a shunt in one of the ventricles and I don't know where but and, and connect it to either your pharynx or a bit lower down and so that just relieves the CSF but I don't know how they keep the infection away that way because you know you just broke the blood brain barrier <laughs> great highway okay now this is the foramen magnum and that's the foramen magnum and those are the
necessarily better tonsils. Yes, it's crowded foramen magnum, and that's a tonsillar herniation. And what's 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 dangerous about a tonsillar herniation? A raised ICP can cause a tonsillar herniation. A tonsillar herniation will not cause raised ICP, but raised ICP can cause a tonsillar herniation. But a tonsillar herniation will kill you. Why? No, but what's the important aspect of the brain? The medulla. So if you squish your medulla, why would that kill you? Because your respiratory drive is lost. So basically the reason a tonsillar herniation, because these are cerebellar. I mean, if you, if you squeeze the tonsils of the cerebellar, they shouldn't kill you. Um, because they'll just cause coordination issues. But what you're actually, what's killing you is squeezing the medulla and the medulla, squeezing the medulla will actually cause the respiratory drive to be lost. Yes. Yeah, very quickly, absolutely. So this is something that, that that's a nice one. So that's a tonsillar herniation on MRI. So that's one area. MRIs are really pretty, but uh, getting an MRI for a tonsillar herniation, you're also, uh, you're also like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, it's, <laughs> die yeah it's like it's like when you see yeah it's like you see the tension pneumothorax x-rays and cts you're like how did that happen <laughs> how's that person still alive <laughs> so there you go so you will see tonsillar herniations this is what you're going to see so it's very important to pick it up in ct that's the ct an MRI for a tonsil herniation, I just can't imagine, but I guess it's there. Um, and so that's that. Uh, good for teaching. <laughs> the amount of people, not good for the person. Okay, an uncle herniation. That's also extremely important because this is, this is the, these, this is the, that's, that's, uh, the three herniations are important. One is the tonsil herniation that you learned. I sh I've actually told you what this is. It's uncle herniation. Uh, and the uncle herniation is actually not fatal, but it gives you a sign of uh, uh, increased uh, intracranial pressure. I mean, it's a very important sign. So this is a good image for an uncle herniation. So basically, oh, come on. It's too small, but I guess you can still see it. Um, it, you saw that little area from the tentorium cerebella. So it is here, this area, you see? Brain tissue can, um, this area, this, this area, brain tissue from here can herniate inwards. And that's an uncle herniation. And one very typical part, it's actually a bit further up, one very cool thing about that is that an uncle herniation is going to compress your ocular motor nerve. That's the, one of the first signs of an uncle herniation, is that it's going to compress an ocular motor nerve. This is a good, this is a good image actually. So an extra, for example, a, 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 a subdural or an extra dural hematoma can cause an uncle herniation. Uh, oh, this is subfalcine. That, that's what we're also going to do. I was going to do an uncle herniation. And an uncle herniation, you will see with a dilated pupil that does not respond to light. Ipsilaterally. So if you're, in the, if you're in the emergency and you see unequal pupils and the bigger one is not reacting to light, then that is a medical emergency and uh, CT head immediately. Um, or called the neurology registrar because that's an uncle herniation and it is and can be caused by any reason, any any cause of an increased intracranial pressure uh, on top. And now that we, this is a good image because it shows uncle herniation, but it also shows the next type of herniation, which is a Falk's hernia or subfalcine herniation. 
So that falcine herniation is because remember that you had a false cerebri here, but you can, if there's too much pressure, you can actually herniate tissue under the false cerebri. And that's called a subfalcine herniation. And there you go, there's another image, a good image of a subfalcine herniation and uncle herniation. And this mass can not only cause subfalcine uncle, they should have made a tonsillar herniation too, because this could also do that, a tonsillar herniation. And so uh, uh, there you go. So uh, in the pathology quiz, that's an uncle herniation. And if you keep coming down, that's a subfalcine herniation. It's shifted from the midline under, under the, under the. Days, not that I can't say. I think if, if it is an uncle herniation, then they will, because the subfalcine herniation can also lead to an uncle herniation. Yes, push it along. But if it's, could be. But I'm not sure if just a subfalcine herniation will cause a dilated pupil. I'm not sure about that. And uh, that's it. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow my Facebook page. Please also support my work on Patreon and Kickstarter. It will be greatly appreciated.